I am uh, Soterios Goudos from Marcel mm -hmm. University of Thessaloniki, Greece. And uh, I am here with uh, Professor Christodoulou from the uh, University of New Mexico. And we are going to discuss about the current trends in artificial intelligence, intelligence in electromagnetics. So, uh, Professor Christodoulou, uh, many thanks for accepting our invitation. Uh, my first question will be, what is your opinion about the current trends in artificial intelligence and its applications in antenna design and propagation modeling? Thank you, Sotiris. Thank you, Dr. Gudos, for inviting me. It's an honor. Um, I would say that, in general, the artificial intel intelligence or machine learning, you know that field has been around for a long time. But in electromagnetics, it started around 20 years ago. There were two books. One was by Zhang and the other one by me. But it was very limited. At the time, uh, there were neural networks uh, pretty much and back prop propagation, very, very simple models. But then later on, uh, more and more people uh, started learning about machine learning. And I can tell you at the beginning 20 years ago, if you had a paper in machine learning and antennas or you know propagation or anything with electromagnetics, it would be rejected because if you try to publish it, people in the electromagnetics community had no idea what machine learning was. They thought it was a black box. So in the last 20 years, a lot of things have changed. And uh, there is now you can see more and more papers. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy for it because there are some applications in antennas and propagation that when you don't have a closed form solution uh, into a problem, then there are two ways of doing it. One is, for example, to go use um, uh, computational techniques. And of course, we got finite difference, finite elements, integral equations, and we combine all those. But they are very time consuming. And in some cases, you've got problems in antennas and propagation where things change very, very fast. For example, when I started, we had reconfigurable antennas. We wanted to have one antenna, one piece of real estate. Let's assume uh, that you have an antenna on a small satellite or on a car, or you know it could be on your computer or your cell phone, but you wanna change frequencies. You wanna change radiation patterns. You wanna change polarization. How can one antenna do it? And then when things change, the satellite is moving, the plane is moving, you know, anything else, your computer is moving, your car with internet of things. Um, you cannot have somebody manually changing these things. You need a system that is smart, meaning using machine learning, artificial intelligence on a microprocessor. So another thing that is very important in this area, and I wanted, you know, the listeners to know, it's not enough to have a good machine you know, learning code or algorithm. You have to make sure that it can be implemented today on a microprocessor. Uh, you know, so then you can connect that, interface it with your antenna, and then it becomes a smart intelligence system. So the future uh, of machine learning in antennas and propagation uh, uh, so theories, I think it's great. You can see more and more papers and more and more conferences have now special sessions, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Asia or the US. Now you can see those more and more coming up. Yes, thank you for your answer. Yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, so uh, there are some key enablers in these cases that uh, drive also the way for 5G and beyond. Uh, what do you think of the concepts of smart radio environment and reconfigurable intelligent surfaces? Uh, do you think that the machine learning will be the key enable in these cases? Absolutely, Sotiris. You cannot do it without machine learning. Uh, there is something called cognitive radio, 
which is a step beyond software defined radio, where a lot of the functions, microwave functions, waveforms, et cetera, can be implemented using software, which means then you you don't use hardware as much, so you can have a lot of um, more inexpensive equipment. However, cognitive radio means you're adding a cognition, you're adding an intelligence, you're adding a brain to your software defined radio. This is what we mean now by smart radio. Some people call it cognitive radio. And in that case, you, you can have smart, in fact, one area that we're working on in terms of research, can you have a, let's say, smart fabric? That smart fabric can have a lot of antennas, can have other type of sensors, could have pressure sensor, light sensors, you know, temperature sensors, along with antennas, all in one fabric. Let's say you stretch it, you put it on a car, you stretch it, you put it on an airplane, you stretch it, you put it on a satellite, anything you want. But then there are so many sensors, you get so much, so, you know, much data, and then you got to do data mining, but a lot of the data, it could be junk, useless. You need to be able to discriminate between good data, useful data, and useless data. All that stuff can be done only with machine learning because machine learning has this capability of uh, discriminating and classifying data and information. So definitely uh, this is why machine learning is picking up steam. Otherwise you cannot do this with deterministic models because things change, change very quickly. So yes, yes, yes. So uh, in these cases that you mentioned, uh, this, I think another question comes to my mind how should the antenna designer adapt to these trends, to the new trends using artificial intelligence? What do you think? I think they should read my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, this, this is a very, very, very good question, Sotiris, and I'm not sure if I have a good answer. Usually when some new... Um, I mean, every single one of us, when we go to college and we get our PhD or master's or whatever degree we get, we focus in a certain area. So then we like to work in this area because we're knowledgeable. When somebody comes in and says, you need to learn something totally different because artificial intelligence, it, it, it came in from the image community, you know, originally, and now it's being adopted by other people, but we use the math behind it. And I can tell you that the math still has not been developed very well. There is a call now in the United States where they want to bring mathematicians with electrical engineers and computer scientists to develop better algorithms because, you know, um, not all the math that is out there is useful. So I would say to people who want to get into that field that <clears throat> there are some books that, and I, I don't want to really promote my book, but uh, I know, Sotiri, you're going to be writing your own book. But the nice thing about books that are relating uh, machine learning with electromagnetics is when they write these algorithms, they write them keeping in mind that they can be used by people who know electromagnetics. So this is the way to start. Find very simple algorithms or papers that explain the basic algorithms. Now, the big problem is that there are a lot of algorithms there and not all of them are useful for every application. So you need some experience or just find out from published work what algorithm works for what problem. Yes, I totally agree. Well, I think when I, I, I give some problems to my students, they try, they try to all the algorithms in Python, but they don't know anything about the algorithms. They just <laughs> use it as a black box. So they should learn the background of it, the, the mathematics. Of yeah, the there is a problem. <laughs> there is MATLAB and um, there is other programs right now that they are, they, they are black boxes, exactly. Uh, so, Thierry, you put an input, um, 
in a training set, you get an output, you label things, you correlate things, and then um, the students don't know what's happening inside all the weights and all the math, and then they just try by trial and error. And uh, of course, MATLAB makes things simpler, but it actually hurts the understanding of the algorithms. And that's a problem. And uh, I've noticed that with my students, you know, so some of them don't write their algorithms and say, well, I got it, it's working, <laughs> it's MATLAB. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, well, one of my favorite techniques, which I have used in several papers is evolutionary algorithms. Uh, do you think that such optimization techniques like evolutionary algorithms will have a, a role to play? in uh, the future? Actually, yes. And that's a good question because a few years ago, we had a lot of those. And then somehow they slowed down a little bit. And uh, I'm not sure why, but certainly a lot of these uh, techniques um, were actually in electromagnetics have been used before machine learning. And uh, they were quite good, especially with sparse arrays. And um, sometimes when you mathematically, it's a beautiful problem because you have a cost function and you want to minimize it and you're trying to figure out how to do it. So from the mathematical point of view, it's a beautiful problem. But a lot of, we, we unfortunately, I don't think, and I don't know what you are doing at your university, but we don't teach these algorithms in a course. So we, you know, usually we teach, even when you teach an antenna, you have so much limited time to cover all the different types of antennas and propagation models. And the only time we get into this is when we do research and you have a graduate student and you tell them, I want you to try this evolutionary algorithm and compare it with another one. So uh, one problem, so theories with evolutionary algorithms is a lot of people don't know why we should use them. Um, why, how do they compare with others, you know? And, uh, but for some applications, uh, I think they're very useful. It's just that you got to choose which one because there are so many evolutionary algorithms. That's another problem. Yes. Well, I think, I think it's a good thing that there are so many evolutionary algorithms so that we can publish several papers. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, um, um, yeah, but the problem is I, I'm a little bit more on the practical side because I want to deliver a product. So if I design an antenna, I want to build the antenna. If it's going to be a smart antenna that is being controlled with an evolutionary algorithm, I need that algorithm to be implemented on an Arduino, Raspberry Pi, FPGA, any type of microprocessor. If I cannot implement that algorithm, so theory, even if it's a beautiful, elegant, published with a lot of citations, then it's good in terms of a paper, but I want to implement it, then it's, it's not super useful for me. Yes, yes, I, I totally understand. Yes, we don't have we don't have a, a course in evolutionary algorithms as well, uh, and we just give uh, students evolutionary algorithms when they are going for a master thesis or uh, towards their PhD. The same here. You should write a book, Satiri. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, what do you think uh, about the, the antenna design papers that use machine learning over the last years? I, I think there's a, gro uh, uh, there's a growth uh, quite uh, large over the last years. How can you, can you comment a bit on that? Yes, 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 indeed. Um, I'm sure you review papers. You're, the, you're an editor for several journals. Um, and we get to see more and more papers now in machine learning. Um, there, there is two trends in here, and one is good, the other one, 
not so good for theory. One is that people wanna truly believe in machine learning and they think that can help them um, solve some very difficult problems. As I said earlier, some problems are closed form. You know, if you don't have a closed form solution, you cannot solve a problem or you have to go into a very expensive, time consuming mathematical computational technique. In those cases, machine learning techniques are pretty good because especially if you combine them, and that's a trend now with uh, computational techniques, you can expedite, you can make those computational techniques much, much faster because of machine learning. And, so, and that's a good thing because you're solving then bigger problems, more complex problems. And that trend I would like to see continue because anyone can go solve very large problems in electromagnetics that instead of requiring massive parallel processing machines, you can solve them using your own computer. So if you can combine machine learning and computation, this is amazing. Uh, of course, there is the other trend or people just like to just publish and they come up with a tweak, a, they play a little bit with a machine learning algorithm as I told you with the, uh, <clears throat> what do you call that again? The MATLAB and they publish. I mean, because the results are good and interesting but there is not a lot of understanding in there. So both trends exist and they're in parallel. But uh, I do think because things are becoming very, very complex and even antenna designs in a big system are not just an electromagnetic problem. They're thermal, they're mechanical, they're deployment of antennas. So you need to worry about all these things. Machine learning will help a lot because there are no closed form solutions to these big problems. Yes, totally, totally. I totally agree. And uh, well, talking about uh, your books earlier, I remembered that uh, when I started working with uh, artificial neural networks, the first book that I, I read about it was your book, Applications of, of uh, Neural Networks and Electromagnetics. And I think was the first that introduced neural networks to the AP society. So are you planning a new edition or a new book on machine learning? Yeah. Yes, you were correct. It was the first, it was in 20, uh, when was it? In 2000, in 2000. So, you know, 20 years ago. And um, yes, it was true. Every time I had a paper <laughs> that had neural networks, people didn't understand what that was the papers were getting rejected. It took a couple of years until people, whoa, maybe it is interesting. So now the paper will not get rejected because it says neural network. In fact, people would want to read it because there is interest now and people want to learn. Uh, the thing is though, Sotiris, and you know very well, you know, 20 years ago, um, people, didn't have all the algorithms. Now we have deep learning, you know, deep neural network. We did not have those the years ago. We have, uh, you know, support vector machines. We got GANs, which are generative and adversarial networks working together. We got a lot of new algorithms that are being developed. And, you know, so we decided to write with some of my colleagues here uh, a new book, it's called Machine Learning Applications in Electromagnetics and Antenna Array Processing. And it's coming next month. And so, Thierrys, you will get a copy from me. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. No problem. Uh, also, another personal uh, note. Well, there was one of your papers that was a really great inspiration for me. Uh, that was a, a paper back in uh, 2005, uh, the one called Linear Array Geom Geometry Synthesis with Minimum Side Lobe Level and Null Control Using Particle Swarm Optimization. And uh, I think it was the first one of the first papers, or the first, 
that used PSO in an antenna array problem. And uh, it was a very good paper. I think it has hundreds of citations. So uh, would you like to talk about the story of this paper? Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, and the interesting story about it is that student is uh, who came in from Jordan to get his PhD here at the University of New Mexico with me, we solved a totally different, pro a different problem. His PhD was on quantum well detectors attached to some antenna, a bowtie antenna. And we're trying to sense terahertz waves. So it was a totally, totally different problem. But then later on, uh, he got a job in Jordan at the university, one of the Jordanian, I can't remember which university there. And uh, at the time, I believe Yaya Rahmat Sami from UCLA have uh, popularized all these uh, uh, particle swarm optimization techniques. And, um, you know, there was people were trying to learn from ants, from bees, from fish schools, how you know <clears throat> a swarm thinks, and how you, for example, uh, if you're a swarm of bees and you have a flower, bees know with you know they communicate with each other. Hey, don't go to that flower. I already took the nectar out of it. Don't waste your time. Go somewhere else. Amazing optimization that nature had. So that student uh, asked me, well, I'm in a new university. I want to have a good uh, um, record so I can get promoted. So I asked him to go look into these things. And you're right. It was the first paper that tried to uh, control the side lobe levels um, of an array and you write, actually, it is the my most cited paper. So you're correct. And I'm uh, surprised you picked on that because not everybody knows these things. So that means uh, you're, you're, you're a good spy, Sotiris. So. <laughs> actually, I was inspired of that to make a paper in Antenna Letters later using, again, PSO in the same problems, but a different variant of PSO. So that was a great inspiration for me, this paper. It's a beautiful algorithm. I mean, and yes. it's, 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 it's easy to manage. The problem is uh, you've got to find the right problem. Not every problem can be you know, applied or not, PSO cannot be applied to every problem. You know? Yes, yes, for sure. So uh, for the final question, Let's go back to the modern techniques, to the modern years. So, well, in your recent papers, I, I have noticed that you have used two techniques, deep learning and, uh, and GANs, generative uh, adversarial networks. Uh, would you like to discuss about the application of these techniques in electromagnetics? Yeah. Uh, wow, this is a very, very, very good question. Deep learning, it's actually not very, very different than, it's just that it's bigger neural networks uh, and it's an extension of the old neural networks that we have. And you're right, even today, uh, we used it a little bit, but it has not been used massively uh, in electromagnetics. So it can handle bigger problems now with more input data, you know, your ve input vectors in your uh, learning stage can be much, much larger. And uh, you can handle things with more accuracy because there are so many la layers of optimization. Um, so deep learning is still evolving, by the way. And the problem is uh, that even the mathematical foundation of deep learning is evolving because <clears throat> sometimes those are those algorithms don't start by mathematicians necessarily. And so they got some, you got to be careful how you train. And sometimes they're not accurate. 
and uh, you can use them, you can get some results. So this is the whole problem with the machine learning is how you train something correctly, whether you use simulated data or you use experimental data. Uh, how accurate it is, it depends on your training. And, um, and th th this, th this is always gonna be a problem. That's why now mathematicians now, true mathematicians, not engineers like us who know math, get involved and are trying to get involved with these techniques. The generative adversarial network, uh, so theory, this is a beautiful approach, uh, not super accurate yet. Uh, it came out, I think around 2014, so it's really new and it's very, very interesting, but it tells you how smart people are. So they use really two networks. One generates, imagine, how can I say as an example, somebody takes your picture, Somebody take, takes my picture and they put it into, um, in this ge generative you know, uh, uh, network, which creates a random input vector. And then it creates images that, that somewhere between you and me, it creates another, let's say another 50 images that don't look like me 100%, that don't look like you 100%, they look something in between. And they all look pretty good images. The problem is they're not necessarily real. So we got a technique to generate data that you could use to train, let's say deep learning or to train some other network. But this gener generative approach also has another network with it. It's called the adversarial network. The ad they both work together. The adversarial network looks at these pictures and say, no, this is not Sotiris, this is not Christus, and it drops them. So the adversarial works against the generative network, but at the same time, it helps it, makes it generate better pictures that make sense. So it, so it gives that feedback, the adversarial network gives a feedback to the generative one, and then eventually, because they work together, you can start generating images that are very good, very accurate, and you can use them for training totally different, uh, like let's say, a, you know, a deep neural network or any other, you know, uh, algorithm. So it's an amazing one, but it's just new yet. And we just started using it. So imagine designing an array antenna there may be a lot of elements that you can use, different elements, different distances, different geometries. I think, and I haven't tried, GAN can be used. I used it on a, um, a you can use it on a logarithmic style type of antenna, et cetera. But when an antenna has a lot of options, I believe these GANs can be very useful. So this one, we should work together on this one, uh, Sotiris. This is a good problem. Yes, yes, for sure, yes. Actually, I was thinking that maybe it could, for example, when you have an antenna designed by a commercial uh, AM solver, you could generate more data that it's very difficult to generate because you have to run the solver. Exactly, many. yeah. You could use the GAN to generate data. Exactly. Yeah, and so other that, possibilities. Yeah. Yes, that's my, my my thought was my first thought about the GANs was that maybe we will try this together. Yeah, GAN is I I actually been talking to my students, and I told them I want to start using GAN more, especially when for design possibilities. I mean, again, in the image world. Imagine you're an artist, you are uh, taking a picture of a Greek island and you can take a couple and then you can generate so many others out of randomly out of a couple of samples. And that's the generative you know, network. And one of them you may like, and you can set the adversarial network to say, well, I like that one. This is good. The other one's scratch and it becomes automatic. And the 
the adversarial could be like a person, a customer that you know will like this product. It's amazing. We haven't really, I think nobody has really uh, studied that extensively. Yes, yes, I totally agree. So that was my final question. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, our discussion and your, your answers to all these questions. And uh, I'm really grateful for all your, uh, uh, for all your time here and uh, our discussion. It's a great honor for me to, to talk with you, to discuss with you these matters. Uh, I really, uh, I think, thanks a lot for, for everything. I also want to thank you, Sotiris, for uh, inviting me. This is, um, I always get excited talking about machine learning and electromagnetics. But I also want to thank Maria Athanasiu, who also set up the, <clears throat> uh, all the technology here for us so we can talk to each other. Thank you, Maria, too. <clears throat>